Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. A reading from Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. The word of the Lord.
A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Now, Jesus came down with the 12 apostles and he stood at a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and still a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him, to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him. For power came out from him, and he healed them all. Then he looked up at his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours the kingdom of God. And blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. And blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. And woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is just what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts ever be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We are all probably quite familiar with this gospel passage, but actually probably not this particular one, but one that sounds just like it. And we find that one in the fifth chapter of Matthew at the beginning of what we often call the Sermon on the Mount. And that passage we often use a code word for, we call it the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. St. Luke takes the same point of Jesus' teaching, and he has his own set of Beatitudes here, very similar to those in Matthew, to be sure, but quite different in other ways. First of all, we don't see Jesus on the side of a hill, teaching the crowds who have gathered around below, but rather we see Jesus among the people, sitting there, perhaps, teaching but as Luke says, on a level place. We might call this, in contrast then, the Sermon on the Plain, as opposed to the Sermon on the Mount. But the teaching is nonetheless similar. Blessed are those who are poor. Blessed are those who are hungry, and so on. What is different about St. Luke's version of all of this is that he includes, along with the blessings, a set of woes, a set of woes. We don't find that in Matthew. And so that leads us to ask the question, what is Jesus trying to do? At least, what is Luke trying to get across about Jesus' teaching as he relates this story to us? And perhaps it lies in the fact that Jesus is addressing not so much the crowd from the world, the people from outside of his disciples, but as Luke says, he came down with his apostles, his closest associates, and he looked up at his disciples. Luke makes a distinction between the apostles and the disciples. And it even says there was a great crowd of his disciples. So by this time, the word about what Jesus was saying and doing was getting around. And there were people who were wanting to hear him and people who followed him. People who didn't just come for a one-off, but decided that he had something important to say and they would follow him. And so they became his students, as it were. They're his pupils, his disciples. And so these are addressed not to the world at large, which we like to think about because with the woes, we think, well, that's, that's not us, that's the other people. But we begin to realize that Jesus is addressing his disciples at that time, and he's addressing you and me as well. You and me as well. So he tells us that we are blessed when we are poor and we are hungry and when we mourn and when people hate us because we follow Jesus. But then he says a series of woes. And I think the key to understanding that is the first one because he says to them, be woe, woe to you who are rich for you have received your consolation. And I think that's a key for us. They've already received what most people desire. And more than likely, as things go in life, they will lose it. They will especially lose it when they pass from this world because as we often say, you can't take it with you. So Jesus is saying that those who are having these wonderful experiences now that that is your consolation. And basically what Jesus is talking about, he's not giving us any commands. He's not the new Moses as he is sort of in, in Matthew's gospel. But even there, he's not giving any commands. He's simply stating facts. 
And so too it is here. He's talking about the poor and the hungry, those who are poor and are hungry as he speaks to them. And he talks to the rich and those who are full that are among the disciples there. And he's basically stating some facts. Because the reality of our life is that most of us at one point or another in life, unless we are exceptionally gifted, will experience some form of poverty. Perhaps it's a time in our life when we are unemployed and money is tight. Perhaps we might even go a little hungry at those times, particularly when parents are trying to feed a household of children, and it's usually the parents who hold back so that the children have enough. And I'm pretty sure that all of us here, at one point or another, have had to mourn the loss of someone we love deeply. We entered into that dark time of grief. And if we haven't really grieved the loss of a loved one, perhaps it was the loss of something important to us, like a job, our health. Now we all mourn and grieve. Perhaps, just perhaps, Jesus is saying that, you know, these, these are the facts of life. But the reality is that riches come and they go. Hunger is sometimes assuaged by the generosity of others or a turn in our fortune. We often move beyond grief simply because the demands of life pull us out of that dark place. Now, these are facts of life. So what is he trying to get at? I think the answer lies in that first word in each of those things, blessed. Blessed are you. In some translations of these passages, both in Matthew and Luke, the translator will put in the word happy. Happy are you. I'm not too aware of anybody who is poverty-stricken as being overly joyful from the point of view of the world. I know there are a lot of people who have hunger pains, and it is not being a happy state of being. So what is Jesus getting at? I think what he's getting at is the fact that that word, the word that is used there, blessed, blessed, happy, it's not a, an emotional word. It's not a word describing our emotions, but rather describing our state in life. And what he's describing is a right relationship with God. That in fact, when we are right with God, we find a certain sense of inner contentment. And that inner contentment can help us overcome any of the challenges we face, like poverty and hunger and persecution. I do know happy poor people. When they're not always looking at their poverty, they're not holding on to that value of the world, but rather they're looking at what God does for them, the gifts that God gives them instead of the riches of this world. I do know people who hunger often, who are content, content with what little they can muster, what little they can give, and they forget, rather, and they find that in reality, there's usually just enough. Blessed. You are in right relationship with God when you are poor. And as long as you stay in that right relationship, you will find what you need. You are in right relationship when you hunger and you see that it is God who is the giver of all good gifts and you will find what you need. 
You are in right relationship with God when you mourn and are able to see that it isn't the end of anything, but in fact, a time to give thanks for what we had enjoyed and lost now. No, this is about holding on to stuff, holding on to things, even to hold on to ourselves, even to hold on to the things of life, and rather to see that they all pass away. And that's the woe side of it. It's often said it is harder to live after you've lost something than to have never had it at all. What's true across the board, whether it's our riches or someone we love or a good career and job, whatever it is, it's harder to have lost it. And we are in a worse position internally when that happens. And maybe that's what Jesus is saying. Woe to you who are rich now. For the turns of life will make you poor. Woe to you who are full in your belly. Because a day may come when you hunger. Woe to you when you want the world to think well of you and are not willing to live out the values of the kingdom that I bring you. Because that's what the false prophets did. These statements of fact, then, are not trying to tell us to do anything, to become poor, to stop eating so that we feel hungry. Oh, maybe those are things we should do so that we can develop a spirit of empathy for those who are suffering in that way. What Jesus is really trying to get for us, get at for us, is that we need to look for the values of the kingdom of God and put them first. Because it's there that we find our true contentment. The things of this world pass away, but the things of God remain forever. It is there that we must place our confidence. It is there that we place our trust. It is there that we find what we need. You know, those first Christians, those first followers of Jesus, those first disciples, after Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended in glory into heaven and they began to do the work of the mission of the church, we find in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, we find it said this, all sold what they had and they put it in a common purse and all received from the common place that which they needed. You see, that's what Jesus is thinking. That if we don't hold on to the things of this world and hoard them for ourselves, we won't really lose them, will we? We will give them away, and in giving them away, we will make sure that those who have nothing have something. That those who are in need will have just enough. Oh, but Father, that sounds like communism. Well, it is. Marx probably said the same thing. But here's the difference. We do it for the sake of the kingdom of God. We do it in witness to our faith in God. We do it out of a motive, not of getting ahead or not of any kind of acceptance of power, but rather surely, surely only because we are living out the life of the way of love. A love that, teaches, that Jesus teaches us must actually give our life away to be real. Blessed are the poor, for they will be rich again. But because perhaps they're not holding on to the things of this world, they already are part way toward understanding what the values of the kingdom of God are. Blessed are those who hunger. They will be filled. 
maybe they're beginning to understand how it is and when we have very little and when we share what little we have, suddenly there's enough for all. Yeah. Jesus is telling us that the twists and turns of life will happen to all of us. But when you put the kingdom of God and its values first, then they will not have that impact that we think they might. We will not live in fear, but in confident assurance. And that, after all, is the definition of faith. We will trust, trust God for everything. That is the kingdom that Jesus proclaims. I invite you to stand now and to profess your faith in God in whom we trust. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead. Come, amen. Holy One, you have created us with the ability to choose between life and death, blessings and curses. Help us to reject the advice of the wicked or sit with scoffers, and by your grace, empower us to put our trust in you. We pray for that we may put our trust in you rather than ourselves. We pray that this spirit may guide the church in its witness, especially the Nippon Sai Kokai Nativity Cathedral Bethlehem the Diocese of Kajo Keiji, and their Bishop Emmanuel Murier, and St. James Longira Parish. And for those of our own community, Nell, Brian, Mary, Jeffrey, Zachary, Cameron, and Colin. Blessed, Blessed are those who trust, trust in, in the Lord. Lord. We pray for our nation and for all the peoples of the world that they may put their trust in you. We pray also for our leaders, especially Joe, our president, Tom, our governor, our legislators, judges, municipal officials, the police, and those serving in the armed forces, that they may seek your guidance and wisdom rather than their own. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. 
We pray for those who are poor, those who hunger, those who weep. We pray for those who are ill, especially Barbara, Rosemary, Bud, Pat, Joyce, Bernice, and Abby. Blessed are those those who trust trust in the Lord. Lord. We pray for those who seem to make poor choices in their lives, especially those who suffer from addictions of any kind. May they turn to you to find guidance. Blessed Blessed are are those those who trust trust in the Lord. We pray for the gifts of your creation, for trees, for rivers and streams, and for all the precious resources you entrust to us, that we may turn from exploitative ways to become your instruments in renewing the earth. Blessed Blessed are those those who who trust trust in the Lord. God, you demand much, but promise that your yoke is easy. Guide us throughout our lives, keeping us ever mindful of the good news of your forgiving and renewing grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And the peace of Christ be always with you. All things come of thee, O Lord.
Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with Luke and Mary and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Savior Christ. 
Christ has taught us, we now pray. the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Faithful God, in the wonder of your wisdom and love, you fed your people in the wilderness with the bread of angels, and you sent Jesus to be the bread of life. We thank you for feeding us with this bread. May it strengthen us that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may embody your desire and be renewed for your service through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.